Welcome to our channel. Today we're diving into the dark and fascinating history of one of Rome's most infamous emperors, Nero. Born into a world of immense power and unimaginable cruelty, Nero's story is a tapestry woven with threads of ambition, artistry and terrifying brutality. Join us as we journey back to ancient Rome to uncover the truth behind the legend of Nero and explore the events that would forever scar his name in the annals of history. Nero, born Lucius Domitius Ahenobarbus, entered this world in 37 AD, a time when the Roman Empire bestrode the known world like a colossus. But his early life was far from the lap of luxury one might expect for a future emperor. His father, a man of notoriously violent temper, died when Nero was just a toddler. He was then raised by his formidable mother, Agrippina the Younger, sister to the then Emperor Caligula. Agrippina was a woman of fierce ambition, determined to secure her son's place at the pinnacle of Roman power. Her opportunity came with the assassination of Caligula in 41 AD. Agrippina maneuvered her way into a marriage with her uncle Claudius, the new emperor. She then orchestrated the adoption of her young son Lucius, who took the name Nero, marking him as Claudius's heir. The young Nero's education was entrusted to the philosopher Seneca, a man of great intellect and questionable morals. Under Seneca's tutelage, Nero developed a passion for the arts, particularly music and poetry, pursuits that would later consume him. But lurking beneath this veneer of culture was a darkness, a cruelty inherited perhaps from his father, nurtured by the cutthroat politics of the Roman court. In 54 AD, when Nero was just 16 years old, Emperor Claudius died under suspicious circumstances. Whispers of poison spread through the city like wildfire, with Agrippina the prime suspect. Whether true or not, the path was clear. Nero, the boy emperor, ascended to the throne of the Caesars. The early years of Nero's reign were marked by a surprising degree of peace and prosperity. Guided by his advisers Seneca and the Praetorian prefect Burrus, Nero implemented a series of reforms that proved popular with the Roman people. He reduced taxes, promoted public works projects, and even staged lavish games and spectacles, much to the delight of the masses. For a time, it seemed that Nero might prove to be a wise and just ruler, a stark contrast to the tyrannical image that would later define him. He took an interest in the welfare of his subjects, offering aid after a devastating earthquake in Pompeii. He even engaged in intellectual pursuits, patronizing the arts and philosophy. But this period of relative tranquility masked a growing darkness within the young emperor. The influence of his domineering mother Agrippina continued to be a source of tension. Nero, eager to assert his own authority, chafed under her constant interference. Moreover, whispers of Nero's excesses and eccentricities began to circulate. His passion for the arts, once admired, was increasingly seen as an obsession. He spent lavishly on extravagant performances, even taking to the stage himself, much to the scandal of the Roman elite. The seeds of tyranny were sown, waiting for the right moment to take root and blossom into the full horror that would come to define Nero's reign. The golden age it would soon become clear was but a fleeting illusion. The year 64 AD would forever be etched in the memory of Rome as the year the city burned. It began in the merchant district, a spark amidst the flammable goods, quickly growing into an inferno that consumed all in its path. Fanned by summer winds, the fire raged for six days and nights, engulfing homes, temples and monuments in its insatiable hunger. Panic gripped the city as flames danced across the night sky, casting an eerie glow upon the terrified faces below. Nero, away at his villa in Antium when the fire began, rushed back to Rome to organize relief efforts. He opened his gardens to the homeless, provided food and shelter, and even dipped into his own treasury to aid in the rebuilding. But the scale of the disaster was immense. Vast swathes of Rome lay in ruins, the air thick with the stench of smoke and the cries of the displaced. Amidst the ashes of their lives, the people searched for answers, for someone to blame. Rumors began to swirl, whispers of arson, of a sinister plot. Fingers pointed to Nero himself. Some claimed he had ordered the fire to clear land for his planned palace complex, the Domus Aurea. Others whispered that he had watched the inferno from afar, playing his lyre and singing of the destruction of Troy. Whether Nero played any role in starting the fire remains a subject of debate among historians. But what is certain is that the fire, 
and the rumours that followed would irrevocably tarnish his reputation, casting a long shadow over his reign. The flames that consumed Rome also consumed the last vestiges of Nero's popularity, leaving behind a legacy of suspicion and fear. In the aftermath of the fire, with suspicion swirling around him like smoke, Nero sought to deflect blame and quell the unrest gripping the city. He found his scapegoats in a small, relatively unknown sect, the Christians. This fledgling religion, with its talk of a kingdom not of this world and its refusal to worship the Roman gods, had already drawn the suspicion of some. Nero seized upon this existing prejudice, accusing the Christians of setting the fire and unleashing a wave of persecution upon them. The persecution was brutal and unrelenting. Christians were arrested, tortured and executed in gruesome public displays. Some were crucified, their deaths agonizingly slow. Others were sewn into animal skins and thrown to wild beasts in the arena, their screams echoing through the Colosseum as entertainment for the masses. Among those who met their end during this period were the apostles Peter and Paul, their deaths marking a pivotal moment in the history of early Christianity. The blood of martyrs, it is said, is the seed of the church and the persecution under Nero, though horrific, only served to strengthen the resolve of the burgeoning Christian community. Nero's actions, driven by a desperate need to shift blame and maintain his grip on power, would have far-reaching consequences. He had unwittingly made the Christians into martyrs, their suffering a rallying cry for their brethren across the empire. The flames of persecution ignited by Nero would continue to flicker throughout the Roman world for centuries to come. With the blood of Christians staining his hands, Nero seemed to descend further into paranoia and excess. His extravagant lifestyle, once tolerated, now became a symbol of his tyranny. He poured vast sums of money into the construction of his opulent palace, the Domus Aurea, a sprawling complex of gardens, baths and banquet halls, all adorned with gold, ivory and precious stones. He indulged in lavish banquets that lasted for days, where guests feasted on exotic delicacies while being serenaded by musicians and entertained by dancers. Nero himself, convinced of his own artistic genius, took to the stage with increasing frequency, acting in plays and reciting his own poetry, much to the amusement and derision of the Roman elite. His behaviour became increasingly erratic and unpredictable. He had his own mother, Agrippina, murdered in 59 AD, unable to bear her influence any longer. He forced Seneca, his former tutor and adviser, to commit suicide. His wife Octavia was falsely accused of adultery and executed. A pattern of violence and paranoia emerged, leaving a trail of bodies in its wake. Nero's reign, once marked by promise, had descended into a maelstrom of cruelty and madness. His actions, driven by fear, insecurity and a thirst for absolute power, alienated even his closest allies. The Roman people, who had once cheered his name, now whispered of rebellion. The once mighty Roman Empire, under the weight of Nero's excesses and tyranny, began to crumble. Revolts broke out in the provinces and the Praetorian Guard, once the guarantors of imperial power, turned against him. In the end, Nero, deserted by all, took his own life in 68 AD, his reign of terror finally at an end. Nero's reign stands as a cautionary tale, a stark reminder of the corrupting influence of absolute power. His story, a blend of fact and legend, continues to fascinate and horrify us centuries later. Was he a monster? A tyrant who reveled in cruelty and excess, or was he a flawed ruler, a product of his time and upbringing, driven to madness by the immense pressures of his position? The answer, like so much of ancient history, remains shrouded in mystery. What is certain is that Nero's legacy is a complex one, a tapestry woven with threads of both good and evil. He was a patron of the arts, a reformer and a builder but he was also a tyrant, a murderer and a persecutor. Nero's story serves as a stark reminder that power unchecked can corrupt even the most promising of individuals. It is a lesson as relevant today as it was in the tumultuous world of ancient Rome. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this deep dive into history, don't forget to like, share and subscribe to our channel for more fascinating stories from the past. See you next time.